the 28th, the emperor today took advantage of an interval of fine weather to take two turns in the calash. He said he wanted a little jolting. His left cheek was still swelled. At about three o'clock, he returned on a short time after having nothing to do. He sent for me, and we walked round the garden for some time. Having perceived the doctor, he beckoned to him. The doctor came up to us, and from him, Napoleon heard that the Russian and Austrian commissioners had come the day before to the gates of Longwood, from which they had been turned away in pursuance of the regulations established by the governor. When we were alone, the emperor, after having conversed upon a variety of subjects, spoke of my wife conjecturing what she might be doing and what had become of her. There is no doubt, said he, a short time after that your situation at St. Helena inspires a lively interest and must tend to cause your wife's company to be sought after. Everything relating to me is still dear to many persons. From this rock, I still bestow crowns. Yes, my dear friends, when you return to Europe, you will find yourselves crowned. Then, speaking again of my wife, he said with an expression of the utmost kindness, the best thing she could do would be to go and spend the time of her separation from you with Madame or some other members of my family. They would undoubtedly feel much pleasure in taking care of her. When we went back to the house, the emperor sat down to work. The campaign of Italy was nearly finished, but he provided me with a new subject. Note, right. These were the words which the ever uttered abruptly when a new idea occurred. What follows is literally what he dictated to me. In this instance, nothing has been altered in it, and he has never read it over. Nope. The campaign of Italy being completed, Las Casas will, in the course of a week, undertake the period from the breaking of the Treaty of Amiens to the Battle of Vienna in 1802, while Europe is at peace. Shortly afterwards, all Europe begins war. The Republic is changed and becomes the Empire. The maritime question becomes the chief cause of the rupture of the Peace of Amiens. This causes will begin by causing extracts to be made from the monitors of that time by little Emmanuel. Under his direction, he must get through at least six or seven a day, which will make 180 or a period of six months in one month. There must be at least a period of six months extracted before we begin. The periods preceding and following that period will be prepared and arranged by the other gentlemen. In making the extracts, the plan already prescribed to Monsieur Montalan must be follow that is of extracting all that relates to one event and referring to the page in month the following will be the great events of this period long list this will be one of the finest periods of the history of france who exhibits in the space of one year on one side a pope coming to france to crown an emperor an event which had not taken place for 1,000 years before, and on the end of the French flag waving over the capitals of Austria and Prussia, the Roman Empire dissolved and the Prussian monarchy destroyed. I take pleasure in transcribing literally the above dictation of the emperor with his first ideas and in his first words in order to show his style and manner. It will be easily conceived with what zeal and ardor both my son and myself devoted ourselves to our task report of which we fully appreciated the 29th. During the dinner, somebody mentioned a pool which stands in our garden not far from the house and which is deep enough to admit of a lamb having once been drowned in it and attempting to drink. The emperor said on that occasion to one of the inmates of the house, Is it possible, sir, that you have not yet had this pool filled up? How guilty you would be and what would not your grief be if your son were to be drowned in it as might easily happen the person thus censured answered and he had often intended to have it done but that it was not possible to get workmen that is not an excuse said the emperor sharply if my son were here i should go and fill it up with my own hands the emperor was already in bed when he sent for me he wished he said to put some questions to me and to inquire of some dates respecting matters which concerned us materially the 30th whenever the emperor took up a subject if he was in the least animated, his language was fit to be printed. He has often, when an idea struck him forcibly, dictated to any one of us that happened to be in his way. Pages which, 
at the first thrower of the finest diction. The other gentlemen of his suite must possess a great many of these dictations, which are all most invaluable. Unfortunately for me, the weak state of my eyes, which prevented me from writing most frequently, deprived me of this advantage. On one occasion, when the English ministerial newspaper spoke of the large treasures which Napoleon must possess, and which he no doubt concealed, the emperor dictated as follows. You wish to know the treasures of Napoleon. They are immense, it is true, but they are all exposed to the light. They are the noble harbors of Antwerp and Flushing, which are capable of containing the largest fleets and are protecting them against the ice from the sea. The hydraulic works at Dunkirk, Avra, and Nice. The immense harbor of Cherbourg. The maritime works at Venice. The beautiful roads from Antwerp to Amsterdam from Ventz to Metz, from Bordeaux to Bay, on the passes of the Simplon of Mount Sini, of Mount Geneve, of the Corniche, which opens a communication through the Alps in four different directions and which exceeded grandeur and boldness and a skill of execution. All the works of the Romans, and that alone you will find 800 millions of the roads from the Pyrenees to the Alps, from Parma to Spezia, from Savona to Piedmont, the bridges of Vienna, Austerlitz to Days Art, Severus, Tour, Rouen, Lyon, Turin, of the Isère, of the Durance, of Bordeaux, Rouen, ETC, the canal which connects the Rhine and the Rhone by the Doubs, and thus unites the North Sea with the Mediterranean, the canal which connects the Schilt with the Somme, and thus joins Paris and Amsterdam, the canal which unites the Rets to the Ville, the canal of Arles, that of Pavia and the canal of the Rhine, the draining of the marshes of Bergwan, of the Comtatan of Rochefort, the building of the greater number of the church destroyed during the revolution, the building of others, the institution of numerous establishments of industry for the suppression of mendicity, the building at the Louvre, the construction of public warehouses, of the bank, of the canal, of the Unc, the distribution of water in the city of Paris, the numerous drains, the keys, the embellishments, and the monuments of that large capital that works for the embellishment of Rome, the reestablishment of the manufactures of Lyon, the creation of many hundreds of manufactories of cotton for spinning and for weaving, which employs several millions of workmen, funds accumulated to establish upwards of 400 manufactories of sugar from beetroots for the consumption of part of France, and which would have furnished sugar at the same price as the West Indies if they had continued to receive encouragement for only four years longer. The substitution of woad for indigo, which would have been at last brought to a state of perfection in France and obtained as good and as cheap as indigo from the colonies. Numerous manufactories for all kinds of objects of art. 50 millions expended in repairing and beautifying the palaces belonging to the crown. 60 millions in furniture for the palaces belonging to the crown of France and in Holland, at Turin, and at Rome. 60 millions of diamonds for the crown, all purchased with Napoleon's money. That regent, the only diamond that was left belonging to the former diamonds of the crown, withdrawn from the hands of the Jewish people at Berlin, in whose hands it had been left as a pledge for three millions. The Napoleon Museum valued at upwards of 400 million filled with objects legitimately acquired either by money or treaties of peace known to the whole world by virtue of which the chefs d'oeuvre it contains were given in lieu of territory or contribution. Several millions of mass to be applied to the encouragement of agriculture, which is the paramount consideration for the interests of France, the introduction of France of Merino sheep. These form a treasure of several thousand millions, which will endure for ages. These are the monuments that will confute calumny. History will see that all these things were accomplished in the midst of perpetual wars without having recourse to any loan, and whilst the national debt was even diminishing every day, and that nearly 50 millions of taxes had been remitted. Very large sums still remain in his private treasure. They were guaranteed to him by the Treaty of Fontainebleau as a result of the savage savings affected on his civil list and of his other private revenues. These subs were divided and did not go entirely into the public treasury nor altogether into the treasury of France. On another occasion, the emperor reading in an English newspaper that Lord Castlereagh had said in an assembly in Ireland that Napoleon had declared at St. Helena that he never would have made peace with England but to deceive her. 
take her by surprise and destroy her, and that if the French army was attached to the emperor, it was because he was in the habit of giving the daughters of the richest families of his empire in marriage to his soldiers. The emperor moved with indignation, dictated his files, these calumnies uttered against a man who is so barbarously oppressed and who is not allowed to make his voice heard and answer to them will be disbelieved by all persons well educated and susceptible of feeling. When Napoleon was seated on the first throne of the world, then no doubt his enemies had a right to say whatever they pleased. His actions were public and were a sufficient answer to them at any rate. That conduct now belonged to public opinion and history, but to utter new and base calumnies against him at the present moment is an act of the most utter meanness and cowardice and which will not answer the end proposed. Millions of libels have been and are still published every day, but they are without effect. 60 million of men of the most polished nations of the world raise their voices to confute them. And 50,000 Englishmen who are now traveling on the continent will, on their return home, publish the truth to the inhabitants of the three kingdoms of Great Britain who will blush at having been so grossly deceived. As for the bill by virtue of which Napoleon has been dragged to this rock, it is an act of prescription similar to those of Scylla and still more atrocious the Romans unrelentingly pursued Hannibal to the utmost extremities of Bithynia and Flaminius obtained from King Crucius the death of that great man. Yet at Rome, Flaminius was accused of having acted thus in order to satisfy his personal hatred. It was in vain that he urged in his defense that Hannibal, yet in the vigor of life, might still become a dangerous enemy. And that his death was necessary. A thousand voices were raised in answer that acts of injustice and ungenerous actions can never be useful to a great nation. And that upon such pretenses as that now set forth murder, poisoning, and every species of crime might be justified. The following generations were approached their ancestors with this base act. They would have given anything to have the stain effaced from their history. And since the reestablishment of letters amongst modern nations, every succeeding age has addressed its imprecations to those pronounced by Hannibal at the moment when he drank the fatal cup. He cursed Rome who, whilst her fleets and legions covered Europe, Asia, and Africa, satiated her vengeance against one man alone and unprotected because she feared or pretended to fear him. The Romans, however, never violated the rights of hospitality. Scylla found an asylum in the house of Marius. Flaminius did not, before he banished Hannibal, receive him on board his ship and declare that the had orders to treat him favorably. The Roman fleet did not convey him to the port of Ostia, and Hannibal, instead of placing himself under the protection of the Romans, preferred trusting his person to the king of Asia. At the moment when he was banished, he was not under the protection of the Roman flag. He was under the banners of a king who was the enemy of Rome. If, in future ages, the king of England should one day be brought before the awful tribunal of his nation. His defenders will urge in his favor the sacred character of a king, the respect due to the throne, to all crowned heads, to the anointed of the Lord. But his accusers will have a right to answer thus. One of the ancestors of this king, whom you defend, banished a man that was his guest in time of peace, afraid to put him to death in the presence of a nation governed by positive laws and by regular public forms. He caused his victim to be exposed in the most insalubrious point of a rock situated in another hemisphere in the midst of the ocean where this guest perished after a long agony, a prey to the climate, to what? to insults of every kind. Yet that guest was also a great sovereign, raised to the throne on the shields of 36 millions of citizens. He was master of almost every capital of Europe. The greatest kings composed his court. He was generous towards all. He was during 20 years the arbitrator of nations. His family was allied to every reigning family, even that of England. He was twice the anointed of the Lord, twice consecrated by the august ceremonies of the religion. This passage is certainly very fine by its truth. 
its diction and above all by its historical riches. The emperor always dictated without the least preparation. I never saw him on any occasion make any research respecting our history or that of any other nation. And yet no man ever quoted history more faithfully, more apropos, or more frequently. One might have supposed that he knew history by quotations only and that these quotations occurred to him as if by inspiration. And here I must be allowed to mention a fact which has often struck me and which I never could say satisfactorily account for it to myself but it is so very remarkable and I have witnessed it so often that I cannot pass it in silence it is that Napoleon seems to possess a stock of information on several points which remains within him in reserve as it were to burst forth with splendor on remarkable occasions and which in his moments of carelessness appears to be not only slumbering but almost unknown to him altogether with respect to history for instance how often has it happened to him to ask me whether saint louis had reigned before or after philippe le bel and other questions of the same kind but if the occasion offered when his moment came when he would quote without hesitation and with the most minute details and when it has sometimes happened to me to be in doubt and to go and verify i've always found him to have been right and most scrupulously exact i have never been able to detect him in error